All right, welcome back. Let's talk about fossils. This is all about rocks, fossils, and how we can mush it all together and interpret geologic time. This is the whole unit's about. So anyway, fossils. So we can look at um, two different columns of rocks, and we can individually kind of come up with relative dating, oldest at the bottom, youngest at the top, same thing over here. But how do we connect the two? How do we connect these two? How can we say, you know, this is related to this somehow, if they're separated by great distances? Fossils to the rescue! So we can use fossils embedded in these rocks to say, oh, you know, uh, you know, I see in this kind of blue, bluish tinted uh, limestone layer has a certain kind of fossil and same thing over here. Oh, they must be of the same age and or not different layers, whatever it may be. Fossils to the rescue. Before we get too far into it, let me give you another part of the super secret code. It is the number five. You got me the number five. One more time, the number five. So fossils, what are they? They're the remains or traces of past life forms. They're most common in sedimentary rocks. There goes sedimentary rocks telling that story. Good story again. But it can also be found in a volcanic ash and volcanic mud flow, so igneous rock material. Um, not often, mostly sedimentary. They're, again, extremely useful for determining the relative ages of, of strata that are definitely separated by, by distance. But we can also use them to ascertain uh, environments of deposition. Oh, this is a, a sea a sea fossil. This is a shallow sea fossil. This is a land animal fossil or, or a plant from land fossil. So we can also determine um, sedimentary deposition environments. Obviously fossils provide some of the evidence for organic evolution uh, amongst what we also see on the planet now. And there's a few different types of fossils depending on who you ask and what you look up, but we'll kind of just categorize them in uh, three different categories. Uh, to uh, trace fossils, body fossils, and molds and casts. So let's talk about each. So a trace fossil, kind of cool, they're indications of organic activity. It's not the animal or plant themselves, mostly animal in this case, but it is some sort of indication that there was a living organism there based on activity like tracks that we might find, whether they're ancient birds or ancient dinosaur tracks. There's a number of uh, ancient dinosaur tracks in Arizona and Utah and Colorado, um, but also little nests or burrows. And of course, everyone's favorite favorite trace fossil, poop. It even, it even looks like poop. It even looks like poop. Look at that. Um, it's not, the, the technical term is coprolite. It's a type of trace fossil consisting of uh, fossilized feces. Um, if there's no poop material there anymore, um, in my in-person classes, we have some of this, and I just start licking it, and people freak out. It, it's fine. It's not poop anymore. It's mostly sediment or minerals or whatever. It's, it's, there's no poop material anymore. But anyway, um, coprolites, they are a form of trace fossil um, consisting of feces, poop, um, and it can provide some great information about the size of the animal and possibly the diet. I mean, the bigger the poop, bigger the animal. So bigger the corporate bigger the animal. So anyway, great little trace fossils. Again, these aren't the organisms themselves, but it's an indication that there were organisms here. There were organisms here. Some, everything poops. All animals poop. So something was here. So those are trace fossils. Then we have body fossils. This is kind of what most people think about when they're thinking about fossils. Um, it's the most common type of fossil found across the world. It's formed from the actual dead remains of animals and plants, oftentimes, again, in sedimentary rocks. Uh, the most favorable of conditions uh, for preservation of body fossils occur when the organism, whether it's animal or plant, possesses some sort of durable skeleton or durable structure and lives in an area where burial by sediment is likely. So an organism dies and uh, where can it get buried by sediment? Maybe near rivers, you know, if it falls into the river, the river can wash sediment over it. Uh, ocean shores, you know, the beach, maybe sediment can get washed over it or swamps even. The reason that's the case is because uh, 
uh, fossils are best preserved when they're kind of buried with sediment, and that allows for the fossilization process to occur. If something dies and it's just exposed to the air and atmosphere, it's just going to decay away, and it's not really going to form a fossil. Um, so burial is, is something you need. So areas where there's sediment that, you know, these organisms could be buried, rivers, ocean shores, swamps, lakes, things, things like that. Um, there's kind of two categories of body fossils, uh, those that contain unaltered remains, so it's the actual organisms itself, the original composition and texture. Um, this can be done by things uh, freezing in ice, uh, mummification, uh, things that are trapped in amber or tar. And uh, the other category is altered remains, so there's been a change in composition or structure where there's been permineralization, where minerals have replaced some or all of the organic material. Um, carbonization, as things kind of decay underground and under pressure, it turns to a carbon or a carbon film. So some examples. Uh, these are unaltered remains. So if you've ever seen the movie Jurassic Park, you know, at the beginning they find that piece of amber with the mosquito in it, and that's what they extract the DNA from to make the dinosaurs. That's an unaltered body fossil. It's the original organism. It has uh, been preserved in amber. Amber is, is a fossilized a tree sap. So imagine an insect lands on a tree. It gets stuck in the sap. It's covered by more sap. That tree material is buried, and, and through time, the amber turn or the the sap turns hard, turns to amber, um, and thus preserving the actual thing. Right, so that's stuff entrapped in amber. Freezing does a good job. This is an actual baby woolly mammoth that was uh, uh, taken out of the the frozen um, frozen uh, tundra ground, the permafrost in in North Russia. Uh, somewhat recently. Uh, in fact, a number of these things have been found. So this is the actual baby woolly mammoth preserved. That is a body fossil. Then you get altered material. For instance, this woolly mammoth, or if you're ever looking at dinosaur bones, those aren't, there's no more bone material left. These things have been permineralized, where minerals have been added to the pores and cavities to the bones. They're more kind of stone-like than bone-like. Um, carbon films, again, as some organic material kind of decays away, especially if it's softer material like plants or fish and things like that, the, the carbon under pressure kind of stains the, 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 the sediment itself. Um, petri here in Arizona, we have dinosaur fossils, but also petrified wood. That is also an altered um, fossil that is no longer the tree itself. It looks like it, but it's been permineralized. The organic material has been um, uh, replaced with, uh, with minerals. So as it's buried by sediment, as the material decays away slowly, individual minerals will get in there and replace what's, what's left, usually if water's percolating through there etc. And then we get molds and casts. So let's say you, uh, you get some organic material, say like some sort of sea creature, seashell. It dies and it's buried. As it, as it decays away, it leaves a, a cavity. And then, oops, let me move me. And then, um, so that's the mold that's created. And then if minerals or sediments then fill the cavity, then that's the cast that's created. So when you find a mold, in, uh, you know, a mold and or cast, again, the organic material decayed away, but something kind of just filled in that gap, sediment usually, and it forms the shape of it, but it's not anything from the, you know, uh, organism itself. So all of these fossils make up the... Uh, the fossil record, it's the record of just like the geologic record is rocks. Fossil record is the record of ancient life preserved in rocks. Um, it needs to be analyzed and interpreted just like the geologic record. Um, it's really the only knowledge we have of most organisms that have ever existed on Earth, you know, happened in the past. We only live in a small slice of Earth's history now, so most things have lived and died in the past so trilobites dinosaurs you know a number of organisms and we only know of them because of fossils and it's not the we don't know of every organism that has ever existed on earth because only certain things under certain conditions will fossilize so there could be a number of things we have no clue about because we've just never had the fossils They've, the organisms don't create fossils they didn't exist where rapid sediment burial after they die is possible so any number of things 
That brings us to William Smith. Will Smith. Not that one. Not the one who slapped Chris Rock. Poor Chris Rock. Um, but this one. Um, so William Smith was an engineer in um, England. He realized, I, I think he would, I think he made like canals. Uh, he was, so he was cutting down through some, some layers of, of earth to make a, a, a canal or a channel or a road or, or a railroad or something like that. And so he started to look at the rock faces and just got interested in it. So he saw that the fossils in the rocks kind of follow the same principle of superposition, oldest fossils at the bottom, youngest fossils uh, at the top. He discovered that uh, the sequence uh, of fossils, um, especially groups of fossils, are consistent from area to area. Hey, this layer of rock has these fossils in it. Hey, 100 miles away, that same rock has these fossils in it. That's, so it's pretty consistent. Thus, he discovered a way, uh, a method, to uh, where relative ages of sedimentary rocks at different locations can be determined. Hey, these rocks have the same fossils. These rocks over here have the same fossils. It's a little bit different, but, oh, yep, relatively they're the same age. So you can kind of go from there. And that enabled him to create uh, the first large-scale geologic map, of which we played around in the past, the geologic map of Arizona. He was the first one to create a large-scale geologic map based on rock types and fossils, and he can now match everything up. And he did his for uh, Great Britain. Um, so this is kind of how we do it. So let's say you have three different, you know, columns of rock, strata of rock. You can match them up, right, again, with, uh, with fossils. So for instance, in column A, right, I have kind of this shale layer, and I come over here, wait a minute, I have shale, sandstone, and shale, but it has the same fossils. So in all of the layers so relatively these are the same age it may look over here i only have sandstone and shale it may look different but it has the same fossils but now i'm still able to relatively date these things plus that also helps me indicate maybe what was going on depositionally in these areas and then so these all all of these layers contain these type of fossils and then i go up all of a sudden these uh don't exist, I get things a little bit different. I get things a little bit different. These type of fossils start to exist. So then um, I have in these, I can now figure out relatively speaking, these rocks are the same age as these rocks are relatively the same age as these rocks. Um, I have the youngest rocks up here with these fossils. I have the oldest rocks down here and these fossils. They're not matching up with anything. So again, now I have a way not only to look at rocks and say oh this is the oldest and this is the youngest but now i can compare these rocks to some other rock strata in some other area hundreds of or thousands of miles away on the other side of the earth if i want to same thing here all right so that all led obviously to the principle of fossil succession and that holds that fossil assemblages groups of fossils like what we saw back here so this is a, a fossil assemblage a group of fossils uh, succeed one another through time in some regular and determinable order um, because different organisms exist at different times each fossil assemblage is unique we know what i find in this layer is going to be different what i find in this layer as i go uh, closer in time to us each assemblage has a distinctive aspect compared with younger or older fossil assemblages. There's, there's something distinct about it, and that's how we can figure out that, you know, this is connected. You know, we can figure out the relative age of this is the same as this is the same as this. Okay. So let's go ahead and pause there. When we come back, we're going to kind of put all this stuff together, stratigraphy, rocks, fossils, and how that's helped us interpret geologic time. See you back here in just a second.